Thank you all for joining. We're just going to get started in a few minutes just to let everybody else trickle in. All right, we have some more uh, people coming in. We're just going to give it another minute and then we'll get started soon. Thank you. May I should get started by unmuting myself first. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brandon Herrera. I'm the communication strategist at the Student Borrow Protection Center. Thank you all for joining us. In a minute, we're going to get started with our virtual press briefing on the Supreme Court case CFPB or Consumer Financial Protection Bureau versus the Community Financial Services Association of America or CFSA, which is much shorter. Um, and they're going to be having, there's going to be oral arguments in just a few weeks on October 3rd. So it's a very timely and important case. Um, just to let everyone know, this is going to be on the record and it's going to be recorded. So to begin, we're going to hear from our speakers. And then after that, we're going to, um, I'm going to hold the, the floor open for a brief Q and a throughout the briefing. You can put, uh, questions in the chat. Please feel free to do that. If they haven't been answered, I'll make sure to read them out loud to our experts during the Q and a section, but otherwise, um, you can definitely click to raise your hand, um, and we'll call on you, unmute you, and you'll be able to ask your question verbally. So on our panelists, uh, our panelists today are experts on student lending, and they're going to speak to the chaos that will result should the right-wing majority Supreme Court carelessly strike down the decade-old law that establishes the CFPB. They're also going to comment on the current stakes that are facing student loan borrowers, colleges, young consumers, and the economy as a whole. So uh, to get started, I'm here with Mike Pierce. Uh, he is the executive director of the Student Borrow Protection Center and is the former deputy assistant director of the CFPB. I'm excited to be presenting such an esteemed and passionate panel of experts. And without any further ado, I give the floor over to Mike. Thank you so much, Brennan. Um, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, so this is a case, um, Community Financial Services of America, that um, has been wending its way through the courts since 2017. 
Um, this was originally filed. Um, CFSA is a trade association that represents payday lenders. Um, it was originally filed as an industry-driven effort to strike down the Bureau's uh, payday lending rule that was finalized under uh, the original director of the CFPB, Director Cord, former Director Cordray, um, and has been working its way through the courts all the way up to the Fifth Circuit last year. When the Fifth Circuit um, reached around the substance of the pleadings and put in place a decision that uh, is really radical in its scope and its impact. Um, for folks that follow the courts closely, the Fifth Circuit is is, is known for doing these sorts of um, policy-based exercises in jurisprudence. Um, and, and what it did in, in uh, both practice, practical effect and um, legally was find that the Bureau's funding structure was unconstitutional. Um, taking a step back, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was passed by Congress in 2010, establishes the CFPB and establishes a funding structure for the CFPB um, that is specified in the statute, but comes from the coffers of the Federal Reserve System. Um, and the Federal Reserve uh, is a federal financial regulator in its own right, in addition to the other um, economic functions it performs. Um, and it does extract fees from regulated banks and that stream of fees, a portion of which is now directed back to the CFPB, and that funds its operating structure. So um, that funding structure uh, was struck down by the Fifth Circuit. And the, the practical effect of that um, was that it, it also struck down the Bureau's payday lending rule um, because a unconstitutionally funded agency cannot promulgate regulations. Um, so this is a step that is even one degree more extreme than just challenging the Bureau's funding structure. Um, it also had the effect of invalidating the substantive rule that was put in front of the courts. Um, and that invites a whole bunch of other questions. And you actually see that in, in some lower court decisions that have followed in the Fifth Circuit. Um, more or less, the CFPB is, is no longer functioning in the Fifth Circuit. Um, there have been other cases where litigants have challenged enforcement actions by the CFPB or guidance by the CFPB um, under the um, precedent set in the Fifth Circuit that the agency is un uh, unconstitutionally funded. And as a result, any action taken by the agency um, is not valid. So we are now um, a place where the, court, uh, the Supreme Court has agreed to take this case up. Um, the Supreme Court is now going to be considering whether the CFPB's funding structure is unconstitutional, and it's also asked to consider whether actions taken by the agency, if it were to determine the funding structure is unconstitutional, are also invalid. Um, I, I frame it that way uh, in part because um, the, the uh, second order effects of a decision by the Supreme Court to invalidate the Bureau's funding structure to um, affirm the Fifth Circuit's holding and effectively apply that nationwide uh, would be to unwind all of the work that the CFPB has done over the course of the past decade plus since it's been in existence. And um, the CFPB has not has been, you know, not without controversy. Obviously, the, the financial services industry really hates having a strong financial regulator with broad authority and the ability to protect working people that have debt or interact with consumer financial products. Um, and as a result, there are a number of challenges in, in courts across the country to various pieces of regulation or enforcement actions. Um, and we are starting to see kind of bleeding into other circuits, uh, litigants preparing arguments around the unconstitutionality of the Bureau's funding structure or the unconstitutionality of, uh, kind of other structural features of the Bureau. Um, and I will take kind of one more step back and say, this is the second time the Supreme Court has heard a challenge to the CFPB. Um, during the Trump administration, a different legal challenge struck down the Bureau's um, independent, only removable for cause, single director structure. Um, so a different piece of litigation went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and a majority of the Supreme Court held that the Bureau itself is constitutional, but the Bureau's single director structure um, insulated the director from accountability in the political process in such a degree that... Um, the the um the agency's directorship was unconstitutional um and and the effect of that case was that um the director of the bureau now serves at the pleasure of the president um that is part of the reason why um director craninger who was uh president trump's appointee to run the agency 
stepped down at the start of the Biden administration um, because the Supreme Court had more or less rewritten the Dodd-Frank Act to allow um, any president to remove any director and to eliminate that one protection from political influence on the federal financial regulator. This is another protection against political influence. Um, you see at the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, appropriations um, give Congress a seat at the table to be able to second guess agency decisions and to use the power of the purse to push industry's perspective on a, a regulator that's supposed to be independent. Um, so this is a kind of a long way of, of, kind of setting up what the agency does and how it works and the stakes of this case. I will just add in one minute, the stakes for the higher education system are particularly high because the CFPB provides oversight over um, the entirety of the way that people pay for college. Uh, and uh, my esteemed co-panelists are going to talk about different aspects of that in much more detail than I will. But I will just say um, one great example of this that I think has gone undercover um, is that the CFPB administers the Truth in Lending Act. And the Truth in Lending Act decides when credit extended at the financial aid office is a private student loan and when it is some other kind of credit. And there are safe harbors in regulations for um, schools that are acting as lenders, um, whether that's a tuition payment plan or certain kinds of short-term institutional loans. There are big pieces of the consumer financial transactions that go on when somebody's enrolling in college that sit outside of the rules that govern private student loans. Um, if the Bureau were to be found to have an unconstitutional uh, funding structure and the Supreme Court were to kind of maximally take that to its end, to do the same thing the Fifth Circuit did and, and basically invalidate everything that the Bureau is responsible for administering, nearly every school financial aid office in the country would be out of compliance with TILA. Um, overnight, you would cause major friction in the way that people pay for college and you would open up colleges across the country to private litigation because there are a set of disclosures and a set of rights that borrowers have when a private student loan is extended by any lender, including a school. And those schools would not be in compliance with those rules because they had been working on in good faith under regulations that were promulgated before the Bureau even existed. Um, but poof, overnight, the Supreme Court could take that away. So um, I'm happy to now turn this over to uh, my colleague, Persis, who's going to talk more about the federal student loan system. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions about that too at the end, but I just wanted to emphasize the the kind of sheer chaos for students and for colleges that will fall behind a decision to strike down the Bureau's funding structure. Thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for being here and talking about this really important case. Um, as, as Mike just mentioned, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has a critical role in overseeing the federal student loan market in particular. Um, and, and even more specifically, what I think in this moment right now we need to talk about is the role that it plays in overseeing federal student loan servicers. Um, it has a critical role both in its supervision of um, federal student loan borrowers, but also in its enforcement powers over these student loan borrowers. And, and looking back over the last several years, the CFPB has made a meaningful difference in the lives of student loan borrowers. It is because of the CFPB's supervision that we now have real data about the success or lack thereof, of the Department of Education's tools for getting borrowers out of default. The CFPB through its supervision has the ability to ask, to get data from servicers. We live in a you know, very data poor environment when it comes to federal student loan servicing. And critically, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been able to shine a light in the practices and see what is actually happening um, to student loan borrowers. But going back to my, my example, as a result of this data, um, looking specifically at student loan borrowers in default and whether or not they were able to success after they got out of default through rehabilitation, finding that most of them redefaulted. And as a result of this data, the Department of Education has changed its policies and its contracts um, and the way that it does debt collection. And as a result of that, more borrowers have access to tools that are more likely to result in their long-term success. This Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has been a critical watchdog in the abusive practices of, of student loan servicers and was the first federal agency to expose widespread abuses. It is the lawsuit against the student loan giant Navient that made the widespread problem of forbearance steering a national issue. And this 
becoming a national issue is ultimately what led to the cancellation of more than 800,000 borrowers loans just last month. And we are expecting more to come. So right now, as the federal student loan system restarts repayment for tens of millions of borrowers for the first time in three and a half years, the role of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has never been more important. Millions of student loan borrowers are making payments for the first time. Millions more have had their servicer change over the course of the pandemic. One of these new servicers has never serviced federal student loans before. The options for student loan borrowers have changed. Borrowers need help right now, but in an environment where we need servicers to step up, they are falling down. Borrowers are dealing with long call wait times. And if they're able to get a customer service representative on the phone, they are getting incorrect information. Backlogs are keeping borrowers from getting the relief that they, that they need and throwing borrowers who should never have to make another payment on their federal student loans are in getting bills again. Borrowers need to know that someone is looking out for them. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has the tools and it has the mandate to do just that. And that is why we need the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to continue to protect student loan borrowers. So with that, I'm gonna pass it off to my esteemed colleague, from Dolly Jimenez, um, who is the director of the Student Loan Law Initiative and a professor at uh, UC Irvine's School of Law. Thank you, Persis. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here. I'm sure you're hearing a lot about how the CFPB's uh, rules and um, uh, and guidelines are integral to the functioning of the mortgage markets, for example, and how striking down the funding structure, um, as the Supreme Court might do, uh, would call into question the funding of many other federal agencies, including most financial regulators. And so there's sort of Havoc uh, to be re, uh, to be uh, wreaked in that way, and those are important and serious uh, dangers. But they're not the only ones, um, sadly. Uh, in markets like student loan servicing, credit reporting, and debt collection, the rules that the CFPB enforces allow good, honest players to have a shot in the marketplace. Without the bureaus finding and fining or even shutting down um, the operations of bad actors, the incentives to act badly by debt collectors, credit reporting agencies, um, or student loan services are enormous. This is because the market doesn't work when it comes to these products. Um, consumers do not get to choose their student loan servicer, credit reporting agency, or debt collector. So they cannot shop with their feet and stay away from unscrupulous or um, law-breaking servicers, collectors, or credit reporting agencies. They are stuck. They don't control who hires a debt collector or servicer, and they don't get to choose who reports to a credit reporting agency. Um, the, credit, the debt collector who skirts the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, for example, one of the laws the CFPB enforces, and calls someone in the middle of the night or contacts their friends and families to intimidate them to pay or threatens to sue when they don't intend to do so, they are far more likely as a collector to collect money uh, to be successful than the, than the collector who uh, abides by the law and doesn't take any of those actions. The student loan servicer who adds illegal fees to a borrower's account or fails to help them get into the right income driven repayment plan will add to their bottom line at the expense of the student loan borrower. And these events are far more likely to happen when maximizing collection or profit are at the heart of these um, entities, of course. Uh, and I was just listing things that have happened before. Without the Bureau, we would have very little visibility into whatever new ways of law breaking uh, bad actors uh, you know, sort of invent. Uh, we might find out after several years um, of individual cases or maybe some state regulator investigation, but we will miss essentially the early warning system that the Bureau provides through its complaint system um, you know, and through its uh, supervision ability at the, at the market level throughout the um, United States. And in the meanwhile, consumers would have suffered greatly. So without the CFPB as the cop on the beat, uh, I expect not just a lot more consumer harm in the form of you know, uh, actual bad things happening to consumer and lost money from their pockets. Um, and, and we have very good evidence of that in the, um, in the time the CFPB has been in existence. Uh, they've returned uh, $17.5 billion, billion to consumers um, and you know uh, some uh, number in penalties and things like that. 
Um, but also expect that the players in these markets that try to do the right thing to follow the law will find it near impossible to do so um, in that they are competing with players who are getting away with, in this scenario, with um, skirting the law or violating it altogether. Um, and so it would be nearly stop themselves from cutting corners in order to compete um, with those other players and profit. The CFPB is the main regulator in these spaces, and without them, we should all be concerned about what will happen in the marketplace. And I think now I'm supposed to hand it over to Brandon, who will take questions. Thank you. Can't hear you, Brandon. <laughs> okay, you can you can tell us is. Uh... It's kind of my first rodeo here. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for their um, expert insight. Um, really appreciate it. Now is the time for any questions. Should any reporters have any questions, definitely feel free to send it over to us in the Q&A um, or feel free to raise your hand and uh, you will be unmuted. Okay, seems like we have one question for Persis. Um, you mentioned that the CFPB is the watchdog overseeing the entire federal student loan system. If the Supreme Court were to strike down the CFPB's funding, couldn't the Department of Justice step in, just step in? Department of Education, sorry, just step in. The government owns most student loans anyway, right? Um, so that, that's an excellent question. And I think... Um, this kind of gets us back to the world before the CFPB existed. And I think one of the things that's important to recognize is the independence of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau as it relates to the federal student loans. Because yes, the, the Department of Education um, does own the loans, which puts it in the position of both the protector, but also the creditor. And so that there's a real conflict of interest with the Department of Education, because the Department of Education is also responsible for collecting as much money as it can um, in some respects, or at least it has that incentive. Um, arguably, it also has the incentive of protecting borrowers, but it holds these dual roles, which means that um, it never is purely in the interest of the student loan borrower. And that's the benefit of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is that it has this independent mandate that is not reliant on also being a debt collector simultaneously. I think it's also important to recognize that the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has different tools than the Department of Education when it comes to remedying um, the problems that it sees. And so I think that's a critical piece for consumers to have, especially where we know that the harms to consumers when servicers violate their rights go beyond just their loan balances. So yes, you can have, um, the Department of Education has the ability to correct borrowers' loan accounts um, and do things like that, but the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has the ability to mandate remedies. And the harms to borrowers often go beyond just their loans. If they have an incorrect amount withdrawn from their bank account, for example, that can impact their ability to pay their rent. It can mean that when they get to a store that they're going to experience an insufficient funds fee um, or have their groceries denied. Um, and so it's important to have both the tools and the independence that the Consumer Financial Protection has um, in order to protect consumers. Great, thank you, Persis. Um... We have another question here for Dalier. What other federal agencies could lose funding? Um, so uh, I suppose in one level, it depends on how exactly the Supreme Court might try to divide things. But as far as I'm um, basically every financial regulator, um, every there's no financial regulator. Um, you know, I'm talking about the OCC, the Office of Control of, of the Currency, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, the Credit Union, you know, National Credit Union Administration, um, uh, NCUA, they all uh, are funded outside of the appropriations process. They're all funded essentially a version of fees. The Federal Reserve, like they're not funded, they're, they're all 
are subject to this. And here's one really interesting thing. To some extent, the Supreme Court itself is funded by fees. It apparently remained open, um, you know, during the shutdown uh, last time because, uh, you know, because they had extra money or money that wasn't through the appropriation process uh, that it could use to fund itself for um, several days. So uh, I think, you know, this notion that, you know, the, the, there's a constitutionality problem because, uh, you know, there are things funded outside of appropriations flies both in the face of the actual language of the statute, but really like it also flies in the face of what we've been doing all along, practically since the beginning of the Republic and um, and what we do with in particular with regards to, um, you know, all of the uh, federal um, uh, finan financial <laughs> regulators. So talk about all the markets going haywire. All right, thank you for sharing, Dalier. Um, looks like we have one more question right now. Uh, this works out really well. This one's for Mike. Uh, yesterday, the CFPB disclosed that it has a pending enforcement action against a large student loan company for cheating borrowers out of their rights to bankruptcy. How would this case impact ongoing enforcement actions like the one reported yesterday? Um, so yesterday, maybe taking a half a step back, yesterday, the um, the director of the Bureau, Director Chopra, denied a petition from the Pennsylvania Higher Education Assistance Agency, or FIA, to set aside a subpoena. Um, apparently, the Bureau, this is all newly disclosed because of this, this administrative ruling, but the Bureau had been investigating FIA for um, collecting debts against borrowers where those debts had already been discharged in bankruptcy. Um, these are private student loans, but a kind of private student loan that is eligible for debt bankruptcy discharge. Um, and the Bureau has reason to believe that this company, um, which has been caught up in a number of scandals over the past decade, um, was systematically collecting discharged debts from private student loan borrowers who had already had a right to a bankruptcy discharge. Um, what we would expect in this case and in the Navient litigation and many, many other cases that are wending their way through either the investigation phase of a case or in litigation um, is that every single defendant in every single enforcement action would move to have that case dismissed because the Supreme Court would strike down the funding um, uh, structure of the agency. And these actions were taken with funds that were not appropriated by Congress. Um, and so, the again, chaos is the theme here. Um, not just this case where this one very bad student loan company was doing something very bad to economically vulnerable people, but every ongoing enforcement action in every federal court everywhere in the country would become immediately jeopardized by overreach from the right-wing court majority. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, is there anybody else who has any questions? Okay, we just got a new one that came in. Um, do you know how many individuals that FIA did this to? I thought that even private student loans could not be discharged. Can I take that? I don't know the number of individuals, but I mean, I don't know if that's uh, public or if they know that. But, you know, the, the I'm a bankruptcy professor. So the bankruptcy code doesn't use the word student loans. It uses like 150 words to describe what we shorthandedly call student loans. Um, and so it's actually, you know, very specific things, which, yes, all fit under the category of student loans, but not all student loans are the ones that fit the category of what the bankruptcy code um, presumptively denies discharge to, you know, unless you go through the sort of rigmarole procedure um, that is uh, uh, that 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 is hard to obtain. So private student loans that were um, obtained to go to a school that was unaccredited or a school that itself could not. Um, you know, was not in the list of, of schools where the Department of Education could um, issue uh, federal student loans. Um, those are not ones that come within the definition, the, the specific statutory definition and um, 11 U.S.C. 523A8. And so they are not the kind of student loans that are prevented from discharge. In fact, they are like credit cards or medical debts or other things that are automatically discharged when there's a bankruptcy. Um, and this at some point, I mean, it was the law was always there, but at some point that, you know, 20 years ago, maybe it was a little bit or 15 years ago in question, certainly not any time in the last um, decade uh, has been in question that these loans uh, were were discharged. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, I guess that about wraps up our briefing today.
Uh, thanks to all the panelists for their expert insights. And uh, thanks to all the reporters who came out and showed up today to learn about this very important and existential Supreme Court case. Um, just for some housekeeping, as a reminder, this panel was recorded and it should be emailed to you and it should also be uploaded to the Student Borrower Protection Center's YouTube channel. All, all of our panelists are going to be available to answer any questions, so please feel free to reach out to me at brandon at protectborrowers.org. Again, that's brandon at protectborrowers.org. I'm just going to put my email in the chat now so it's easily accessible. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me directly if you want to be connected to any of our experts today. Um, but without further ado, I guess we can conclude this. And I thank you all for your time. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their days. Thanks, Richard.